We are live. Good morning. Good to have those of you here in the auditorium. I heard it say good morning. Uh, those of you online, thanks for joining us. I walked in, you know, church, it was 63 degrees. I'm like, perfect. Finally, the temperature is good for me. But I know the rest of you don't like it that cold. So uh, we, we had a little furnace incident. Of course, you know, it was 90 two weeks ago, so we shut it off and then uh, it didn't, it, it, it figured it was on strike for the rest of the summer, I guess, and so it didn't cooperate, and uh, Don got his heart going a little bit extra this morning when it made some extra noises and stuff, so uh, we got the old backup there in the corner, and uh, I trust you're not freezing to death. Um, about 10 minutes we'll go outside and warm up. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, that would be kind of distracting. But, uh, just six months ago... <coughs> On Sunday, November 21st, 2021, a joy-filled Christmas parade in Waukesha, Wisconsin, comprised of marching bands, children waving pom-poms, and Milwaukee's famous dancing grannies, ended abruptly and tragically when Daryl Brooks Jr. drove through police barricades with an SUV and plowed his way through the parade, killing six people and injuring another 62. The celebrating and music instantly stopped. Singing turned into shrieks. Laughter turned into crying. Joy on people's faces turned into terror. And the anticipation of what was coming next in the parade left that to seeking the people that you were with to make sure uh, that they were okay. And then came the sirens. Not a pleasant scene to be reminded of by any means. Uh, some of you may be surprised to learn that there was a parade in the Bible that ended in death. Uh, please take your Bibles and turn to 2 Samuel. 2 Samuel, if you're using a pew Bible... It's page 254. We have a, a pew Bible there between the songbooks. Uh, if it's your own Bible, uh, it's towards the front of the Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. Once you get past Joshua and Judges, you come to Ruth. Then First and Second Samuel. Second Samuel chapter 6. Again, page 254. I'm going to read verses 3 through 7. Second Samuel 6. Starting with verse number 3. And they set the ark of God upon a new cart and brought it out of the house of Abinadab that was in Gibeah. And Uzzah and Ohio, the sons of Abinadab, drave the new cart. And they brought it out of the house of Abinadab, which was at Gibeah, accompanying the ark of God. And Ohio went before the ark. And David and all the house of Israel played before the Lord. Uh, on all manner of instruments made of fir wood, even on harps, and on psalteries, and on timbrels, and on cornets, and on cymbals. And when they came to Nashan's threshing floor, Uzzah put forth his hand to the ark of God and took hold of it, for the oxen shook it. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah, and God smote him there. For his error. And there he died by the ark of God. Death here was obviously not caused by a reckless criminal in an SUV, it was caused by God himself. God himself struck Uzzah dead. But why? What, what was his error? The Bible says there in, in verse number 7, what was his error that was so horrible and wicked that God struck him dead? Did God overreact? Was God just in doing what he did? Uh, that's what we're going to look at this morning. Let's uh, ask the Lord to bless the time uh, the preaching of his word. Father, again, we uh, thank you for being able to be here. Uh, Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you that all scripture is inspired 
by God. It's given by inspiration from you and of you, and it's profitable. And so, Lord, even these things in the Old Testament that we sometimes neglect and fail to think about, uh, they are profitable for doctrine, for uh, correction, for instruction in righteousness. Uh, they are to remind us of who you are and how seriously uh, you take sin. And Lord, we, uh, we thank you for your word. We thank you for uh, what we can learn from it. And Lord, I just pray that you would help us now to uh, discipline our mind and our thinking, uh, not focus on uh, the rest of the day or the week or the problems that we have going on, but just to give uh, you our undivided attention as we look at your word. Uh, we thank you that you've given us your word, and thank you more than that, that you've given us your son, uh, that we have the opportunity to be forgiven and to be certain of heaven because of what Jesus Christ did for us. And so, Lord, uh, just work in our hearts now this morning, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Number one there on your outline, to, to really understand uh, what happened, the significance of what happened here, uh, we need to start with number one, young people, there's your clue, uh, number one, the description of the ark, the description of of the ark. There are primarily two arks in the Bible. Uh, obviously the one that God had Noah build to rescue his family uh, from the flood, and then the one referred to here. It's important when we talk about the ark that we pay attention to the context. Uh, I was a few weeks ago, probably a month or so ago now in Sunday school, we were talking about the ark. And uh, I was talking about this ark, and the kids were like, Totally confused, like they're thinking the big boat, and of course, uh, you know, we, we need to make sure that we're we're uh, we have the context. Last Sunday, Mac and I were talking after church about going to see the life size ark in northern Kentucky, and we're talking, and then all of a sudden he made some movement with his hands, and shame on me, I thought he shipped gears on me. He was he was showing what the a proportional, you know, what a long width versus length, length versus width, I guess. And he was, and for some reason, I thought he shifted gears and was talking about the other arc, so it was the young guy that was confused, not the senior saint. But, you know, we, we need to know the context when we're talking about the arc. So the arc we're talking about is not a boat. Uh, we are talking about the arc of God. And, uh, I didn't read the whole passage, but uh, it's called the Ark of God in verses 2, 3, 6, 7, and 12. It's called the Ark of the Lord in 9, 10, 11, 13, 15, 16, 17. So the Ark of God and the Ark of the Lord are being used interchangeably. And we get a little bit more idea of what this Ark is. Uh, look at verse number 2. David arose and went with all the people that were with him from Baal of Judah to bring up from thence the ark of God, whose name is called by the name of the Lord of hosts that dwelleth between the cherubims. So we're going to talk about that in a little bit. But letter A on your outline, the specifics. The specifics of the ark. The ark was a box for lack of a better word, that was roughly, and I say roughly, not exactly, it was roughly four feet long by two and a half feet wide by two and a half feet deep. Uh, the Bible gives detailed instructions in Exodus 25 on how to build the ark. Uh, we're not going to turn there, but you can actually flip over your outline, and there's a picture of it. I gave you a picture of the ark. So you'll want to come back to your outline, but you can flip that over and look. It was a box, and it had carrying poles, and those things on the top are cherubim. They are angels that were on top of what's called the mercy seat. So I have back on the front side of your outline, uh, Exodus 25, verse 21, and thou shalt put the mercy seat above upon the ark, and in the ark, so in that box, thou shalt put the testimony that I give thee. Testimony is another name for the Ten Commandments. 
So the Ark had a cover. Uh, it, it enclosed the box. Inside that were the Ten Commandments. Uh, later, there was uh, Aaron's rod that budded and a pot of manna uh, was put in there, actually earlier than this. But now Exodus 25, 22, again on your outline. So the ark's going to have a cover, it's going to have a mercy seat, and then he says in uh, verse 22, And there I will meet with thee, and I will commune with thee from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubims, which are upon the ark of the testimony, of all things which I will give thee in commandment unto the children of Israel. And so God says, above the mercy seat, between those two cherubim that are looking at each other and have their wings spread out and looking down on the mercy seat, God says, I am going to commune with you from there. Now, we know... And, and notice the poles, uh, maybe you already looked at them, but the, the Bible, our King James Bible calls them staves. But the, the poles in the ark were used for carrying. So you'll, you need to remember that. Number, number, I did that last week. Letter B, letter B on your outline. The symbolism behind the ark. The symbolism behind the ark. The ark then was a, a symbol of the presence of God. God said, I will reveal myself there to you. Now we know God is not confined to a certain place. Uh, I have on your outline there, 1 Kings 8, 27, when, when Solomon is dedicating the temple to God, uh, he says this, But will God indeed dwell on the earth? Behold, the heaven and heaven of heavens cannot contain me, how much less this house that I have built. He said, God, I built this wonderful temple for you, but I know your dwelling place is far above anything that man could make. And so the ark was not there God stayed and there God, you know, God was confined to this body. It wasn't that at all. But he said, I will come and I will speak to you from over the mercy seat between the two cherubim. So it was a, a, a symbolism uh, behind the ark was the presence of God. Letter C, the significance of the ark. To understand the significance of the ark, you're, you're getting some Old Testament Moses tabernacle teaching here uh, today. But to, to understand how important the ark was, this piece of furniture, uh, we need to know a little bit of how the people in Israel worshipped God. Uh, we know when they left Egypt, they went on foot, and they were in tents. Uh, they moved from place to place to place, and they did this for 40 years. And so the place they worshipped was not a building, it was a tent. It was a tent that was called the tabernacle. And... It was movable, they could take it up, put it down. Uh, it was inside a courtyard. So imagine a courtyard, uh, and I'm, I'm not super good on dimensions, but for the sake of illustration, let's say the courtyard went to the edge of the parking lot to the woods over there, okay? It was 150 feet this way, 75 feet that way. So it was a rectangle outer court, seven and a half feet high, made out of fine twine linen. Think of like a curtain that ran all the way around. The tabernacle was a tent inside of that big courtyard. The tabernacle was roughly 45 feet by 15 feet. Okay, This auditorium, I was actually here with the tape measure last night, from this wall to that wall is 40 feet. So it's a little bit longer that way. Okay, it would be a little bit longer, the tabernacle. And uh, 15 feet wide, of course, is only about this wide, okay? From the edge of the pews over, I think it's 17. If you're gonna take a tape measure, I'll check me afterwards. But anyway, so you, you get the idea that the tent is like this, longer. It was divided into two parts, not in half, two different sections. Uh, one part was called the Holy of Holies, and that was 15 feet square. So think from this wall 
to about the front pew uh, being sectioned off by a curtain. Curtain called the veil was, I've read, like four inches thick. Okay, it was it was thick. It was not a curtain. Uh, it, it it was super thick. All right. So you got the picture so far. So the ark, the picture of that piece of furniture that you have, was the only thing that was inside this front part, the holy of holies. The ark was the only thing in there. There was other furniture out there. But the thing you need to know is that the ark was the most important thing in of all the furniture in the tabernacle, in the tent of worship. Letter D. Letter D. The sacredness of the ark. The sacredness of the ark. The ark wasn't just significant. It was also sacred. So what's the difference? I'll explain to you. If you, some of us will appreciate this illustration, if you go fishing, a fishing pole is a significant thing to have when you go fishing. It's important. It's significant. However, it is not sacred. We do not worship our fishing pole. We do not bow down to our fishing. Now, we try to take care of it. You know, a broken tip doesn't help you much, and, you know, some other, we try to take care of it, but we don't worship, we don't treat it as an idol or something to reverence, uh, so something can be significant, like a fishing pole, but it's not necessarily sacred. The ark was significant, most important piece of furniture, but it was also <coughs> sacred. It was treated in a special way, and there's two ways we're going to see that, so sub point one really got to drilling down in the outline here. Uh, we see it was treated in a special way in at some point number one, approaching the ark. Approaching the ark. So you have the picture. It's in the Holy of Holies. It's in behind this curtain. Once a year, the priests approached the ark of the covenant. One time per year. On the Day of Atonement. Leviticus 16 talks about Day of Atonement. We don't need to turn there. But here's, here's a recap of it. Only the high priest could go from that part into this part, the Holy of Holies, one time per year. He wore special clothing. He came in with hot coals and incense. He then came in, he then sacrificed a bullock an animal for his sins. And he came in and he approached the ark and he sprinkled blood once on the top and then seven times down on the ground. The Bible says upon and then before, so in front of the ark. He went out again. He got a sacrifice for the people, a goat. He came in with the blood of that and he sprinkled again the blood the same way, once upon and then seven times before. That happened one time per year. How important was it to follow those instructions? Twice in the chapter that gives the instructions, it has the phrase, do it this way, lest he die. God took very seriously how you approached his presence, where his presence was, where the symbol of his presence. If the priests fail to do things God way, God's way, they can lose their life. There's a second way that we see the sacredness of the ark, and that's moving of the ark. Some point number two there, moving the ark. Shouldn't surprise us if God gave very detailed instructions on how to approach it, that he would, all, he would, he would also give detailed instructions on how to move the ark. We have the instructions for that, and uh, mark the spot. We're going to come back here, but turn to Numbers chapter 4. Numbers chapter 4. So from where you are, it's towards the front of the Bible. Fourth book in the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. Numbers chapter 4, uh, Pew Bible. It's page 112. 
Numbers chapter 4 gives us the details on moving the ark. Numbers 4, verse 4, says, This shall be the service of the sons of Kohath in the tabernacle, tabernacle of the congregation about the most holy things. We know from uh, verse number 2 that the sons of Kohath were sons of Levi. So Levi was the priestly family, sons of Kohath. Uh, their responsibilities, so that's what this chapter is about, is going to give the responsibilities of what the sons of Kohath had to do. Verse 5, And when the camp setteth forward, God says we're going to move. Pillar, pillar of cloud in the day, pillar of fire by night. When the camp setteth forward, Aaron shall come, and his sons, and they shall take down the covering veil. So that veil that separated the two parts would be taken down and would be used to cover up the ark. Take it down, the covering of the veil, cover the ark of the testimony with it. And then uh, verse 6 talks about that it would be covered up with other things. They would put waterproof covering over it. And uh, one commentator pointed out, I thought this was interesting, uh, the ark was the only thing that had brightly covered cloth over the top of the waterproof. Everything else looked mundane because they had some kind of skins over the top of it, waterproof. But the ark had a blue covering so that of all the things that were being carried, you could tell, oh, there's the ark. The ark is over there. Jump ahead now to verse 15. And when Aaron and his sons have made an end of covering the sanctuary, so all the other things, not just the ark, all the vessels of the sanctuary, as the camp is to set forward after that, the sons of Kohath shall come to bear it. They shall come to bear it. Bear it means carry it on their shoulders. How do we know they were supposed to carry it on their shoulders? Uh, because in number seven, we're not going to turn there, uh, Moses actually gave some of the Levites carts to carry some of the things, but not the sons of Kohath. Numbers 9 on your outline. But unto the sons of Kohath, the ones who were supposed to carry the ark, he gave none, no carts, because the service of the sanctuary belonging unto them was that they should bear it or bear upon their shoulders. They were, and you saw that you have the picture there. Again, that's not a picture from 5,000 years ago. It's a picture of what someone thinks it looks like. But there were poles on it, and they were to carry it by the poles. And again, verse 15, the end of the verse, uh, they shall not touch any holy thing lest they die. They carried the ark by the poles. They were not touching the ark. They were touching the poles. So there you have a long description, introduction to the ark. The next three points will not take that long, I promise. Uh, number two on your outline. So go back to 2 Samuel chapter 6. Back to 2 Samuel, again, uh, page 254. Back to Samuel 6 and 2 Samuel 6 and... Item number two on your outline, we're going to see the desire of David. The desire of David to bring back the ark. Verse number one. 2 Samuel 6, verse one. Again, David gathered together all the chosen men of Israel, 30,000. And David arose and went with all the people who were with him from Baal of Judah to bring up from thence the ark of God, whose name is called by the name of the Lord of hosts that dwelleth between the cherubims. So David had a desire to bring the ark to the center place of the nation, Jerusalem, where he was king. Letter A, the reason for bringing the ark back. The reason for bringing the ark back. Uh, during the reign of Saul, you remember King Saul was the first king of Israel. During the reign of Saul, the, the respect and the attitude towards the ark was at a low. All right, Eli was a priest. 
Eli had two sons, Hophni and Phinehas. Uh, they were wicked men. Uh, in fact, one, one verse says that they knew not the Lord. Think about that. Here were priests that did not know or fear God. They didn't know him. They didn't have a relationship with him, with, with God. And they treated lightly, lightly the things of God. Uh, they treated lightly the sacrifices. They encouraged people to disobey God. They were obviously not uh, men of God. And their view of the ark was, it is nothing more than a good luck charm. And so they actually, God's people, are fighting the Philistines, and they said, take the ark with you as a good luck charm, and maybe God will spare us. Well, guess what? They lost to the Philistines, and God allowed the ark to be captured by the Philistines. So here's this symbol of the presence of God has left Israel. It's now in the hands of Philistines. So even though God allowed the ark to be captured by the enemy, he did not allow them to think our gods, little g, of the Philistines, are greater than the true God of heaven. God did not allow that. In fact, the Philistines had nothing but problems with the ark when it was brought to them. First, they took the ark of God, they brought it to the temple of Dagon, which was an idol of vegetation, if I remember right. They brought the Ark of God into an idol-worshipping place. They got up in the morning. Dagon, a statue, had fallen face first towards the Ark of God. You know, think about this. So then they had to... Who would want a God that you have to move? I mean, they had to pick up their God, little G, and prop him back up, and they thought, oh, he must... whatever... Um, same thing happened the next morning he was face first again in front of the Ark of the Covenant only this time God had cut off his head and cut off his hands so this idol, statue whatever you want to call it obviously was not real not alive, helpless and God made sure the people knew that he was the true God of heaven that isn't the worst of it. At the same time, all these people in the city of Ashdod, where the ark was, they all started getting tumors or boils. And then they started to die. And then mice overran the country. If, if you read it, um, some historians think the bubonic plague uh, struck, that God struck them, if he used it bubonic plague or not, but anyway, uh, they're like, they're sick, they're dying, they're getting these boils, there's mice everywhere, they take the ark and they send it to another city. Gets to the next city of the Philistines, same thing happens. They send it to, Gaff sends it to Ekron, and, and it shows up in Ekron, and Ekron says, get this thing out of here, you're trying to kill us all. And so they're like, they put up with this for seven months. Finally they said, and I'm paraphrasing, of course. Uh, enough is enough. We need to send this thing back to Israel. But they were curious. Is God really doing this? Or is it a coincidence? And so they came up with a test. They said, here's what we're going to do. We're going to find out if God's hand is behind this or not. And so they took the ark. And they put it on a cart. And they said, and, and they took two cows who had just had calves. Two cows that just have calves have one thing on their mind. The calves. The calves. The calf. That's all they think about the calves. And they're like, okay, we're going to tie these cows to this cart. We're going to take the calves home. And if these two cows 
aren't worried about their calves, and they head straight to Beth Shemesh, the closest city in Israel. If they head that way, we know God is behind it. If they head home for their calves, we'll know it was just a coincidence that we were dying and getting tumors and mice over in the land. You probably know what happened. On your outline there, 1 Samuel 6, verse 12. You're in 2 Samuel. Don't try to find this verse in, first, in 2 Samuel. You won't. But uh, I have it there on your outline for you. Uh, and the kine, the cows, took the straight way to the way of Beth Shemesh and went all along the highway, lowing as they went and turned aside, not aside to the right hand or to the left. They headed, left their calves, didn't think about, headed straight to the land of Israel. A number of years went by. Some, some commentators say as many as 70 years, but uh, at any rate, David uh, is now king in Jerusalem. He wants to bring the ark back there. He wants to bring the ark to the center of the, the nation. And so uh, he has good reason for bringing it back. And then letter B on your outline, uh, notice the respect, the respect in bringing it the ark back. David was not treating this lightly. David was going all out. 30,000 of the nation's dignitaries he brought there to be a part of this. Uh, in verse 5, I read earlier, there was a wide range of musical instruments that were played. Uh, First, First Chronicles 13 is a parallel chapter, and that adds that not only was there music, there was singing. So this one, there was a parade going along to celebrate this ark, leaving this family of Abinadab and coming to the city of Jerusalem. A mighty celebration. One small problem, though, which actually turned into a, a major catastrophe, and that was this. David failed to... Make sure he was doing God's work, God's way. How was it supposed to be transported? With those poles by the sons of Koath. How did they transport it? The same way the Philistines did, on a cart. A man named Mitchell wrote this, If God were worthy of their worship, why did they take no sufficient pains to worship him according to his word? Why didn't they do things God's way? Number three, number three, the disobedience and death of Uzzah. Disobedience and death of Uzzah. Back to verse number six. When they came to Nashan's threshing floor, Uzzah put forth his hand to the ark of God, took hold of it, for the oxen shook it. A clumsy ox. Stumble. The ark looked like it was going to fall. Uzzah, maybe even just a reflex reaction, put up his hands to stop it. You would have thought he was a hero, making sure the ark didn't fall. God struck him dead. So just like the Waukesha parade, things came to a screeching halt. Imagine, stop, and then the noise, the, the word travels back. Uzzah was killed, Uzzah was killed, Uzzah was killed. What happened? So, how could God be so cruel, so harsh, so hasty to kill someone who was really, it seems like, doing a heroic act of making sure the ark didn't fall on the ground? Number four. Number four, the defense of God regarding the death of Uzzah. The defense of God regarding the death of Uzzah. So how do we defend God for behaving in such a way? Well, on the one hand, God doesn't need us to defend him. God is God. We are not. He is perfect. We are not. If God does something that we do not understand, the problem is in our understanding, not in what 
God did. And yet we still have questions in our minds of, wow, God is long-suffering, and he certainly wasn't here. He was very uh, hasty, we would say. So what are, what are we to think? What are the lessons? What are, what are the takeaways? Letter A on your outline, God is holy. That's the obvious one. God is holy. Because he is holy, he hates sin, he punishes sin, and he does right when he punishes sin. Now we, we need to make sure we're firm on that. God can never do wrong. So God can never judge too harshly. He's not the angry father that loses his temper and is tired of counting to ten a hundred times and blows his stack. God is not that. God is perfect. And so God is always just when he gives out punishment. He is holy. So how do we, how do we break that down a little bit? Number one, God expects us to know what he says and obey what he says. God expects us to know what he says and obey what he says. Both David and Uzzah should have known the ark was not to be put on a cart and the ark was not to be touched. It was to be put on poles and carried by the sons of Kohath. They should have known that. On a similar note, God, number two, God expects us to look at his word to find out how to please him. Look at the, his word, not the world. The world will tell you, you need this kind of music and that kind of that and this. What does God say? And so they should have, what does God require in his word? Number three, sometimes God's things can become commonplace to us. We see in verse 3 that the ark had been in the house of Abinadab. Mm -hmm. Abinadab had two sons, Uzzah and Ahio. Maybe Uzzah, 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 it's Uzzah. If you go to howtopronounce.com, it's Uzzah, but I slip up once in a while. Um, it was commonplace to him. He got used to it being around because he grew up with it, so to speak. It was to him possibly just another thing in the house. Can that happen to us? Can things become commonplace? You know, after the after we were closed up for COVID for a couple months and you know, we we value coming to church. We don't like online church. We value coming to church. But I'm not asking, I'm, you know, ask yourself, is it coming? Ah, it's not a big thing to go to church anymore. We're used to it. How about our Bibles? How do we treat our Bible? I'm not talking about worship your Bible. I encourage people to underline in their Bible. I encourage people to highlight in their Bible. I encourage people to use their Bible. But has it become in your house just another book or is it God's word see we can fall into the trap of things becoming commonplace as well so holiness is certainly taught here but here's another one we might not think of and we're almost done uh, letter B God is approachable God is approachable verse number 11 the ark of the Lord continued in the house of Obed-Edom the Gittite three months. And the Lord blessed Obed-Edom and all his household. It doesn't say God struck dead all the household of Obed-Edom. It doesn't say that. God blessed them. And God not only blessed him, God blessed the entire family. He didn't send tumors and death and mice. He blessed them. Well, that means, obviously, that God is approachable. He is approachable. God is good. God is loving. God is merciful. God accepts people that come to him his way. 
You know, we read an account like this and you might come away with it. Wow, God is chopping on a bit, just looking forward to somebody to mess up so he can come smack. No, God is not like that. But God has a way to be approached. He is the God of mercy. He delights in mercy. He was the God that dwelt over the mercy seat, right? How can we approach God? Hebrews 10, 19 on your outline. Hebrews 10, 19. Wonderful verse. A picture that in the New Testament that flashes back to this holy of holies that I talked about. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. Think through that. Before, only the high priest could go into the holy place once per year. Now, anyone can go in anytime. No priest, no mediator is needed. Before, it was a fearful thing. Do it right or die. Now, God says we can come boldly. Before, a bull and a goat had to be sacrificed. And not just once. It was that day, year after year after year. Christ died once. I just gave you the reference, I think, Hebrews 10, 12. But this man, Jesus, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. We don't have to... We, we, Christ died once. Once for all. We don't have to keep on experiencing his death, reenacting his death. God is holy. And God still hates sin. I was teasing the kids in Sunday school. I said, how many of us would be in Sunday school class if God struck us dead when we sinned? And they all wisely said, uh, we would have an empty classroom. Zero, right, Lauren? Zero. None of us would be here. God doesn't do that. But make sure you don't forget this. God has not changed. Don't think, oh, God is less holy now. God is still holy. God still hates sin. God still punishes sin. God still requires that he be approached a certain way. And that way is through the blood of Jesus. You have it right there in front of you. I love 1 John 5, 11 and 12. We have it on our sign. You have it there on your outline in front of you. And this is the record or the testimony that God has given to us eternal life. And this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. First of all, eternal life is a gift. God hath given to us eternal life. It is a gift. It is not earned. Secondly, it is a gift that is tied up in Christ. It is in Christ. And it plainly says, if you have Christ, not know about him. Yeah, I agree, he's up there. If you have Christ, you have eternal life. If you don't have him, you don't have eternal life. There is no option C. There is no middle ground. You have Christ, you have eternal life. You don't have him, you don't have eternal life. So the question is, do you have Christ? There is one way to approach God, and that is through the blood of Christ. Do you have the Son? Let's pray. Father, can we, uh, we thank you for your word. Uh, Lord, a lot of ground uh, covered here this morning. Uh, but, Lord, when we think of the way uh, you had to be approached in the Old Testament, the sacrifice of animals, and we know, Lord, that those are just a picture of Christ, the Lamb of God that will take away the sins of the world. And we thank you that your Son, our Savior, shed his blood at once, and it was sufficient. And we can come into your presence in the, in the holiest place because Jesus Christ paid our debt. He paid the penalty that we deserve. And, and so we thank you for your love in sending Christ. Uh, Lord, I pray that you would impress upon each of us the need that we have for Christ, uh, but also uh, the reality that 
although you are holy, you are approachable, but we need to come to you your way. And so, uh, Lord, really make that apparent uh, to us. And uh, Lord, thank you that you know hearts. Thank you that you know spiritual needs. And I pray that we would respond in the way you desire and ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So what would ha God have us do this morning? We're going to sing an invitation hymn in just a minute, but first receive the Son. If you don't have the Son, you need the Son. Accept Christ. But what about those of us that know Christ? Those of us that are God's children? What does God expect? Some of these things I gave you already. He wants us to know what He says and do it. He wants us to worship Him according to His Word, not according to the world. And He wants us to value His things, not treat them as commonplace. I invite you to stand. We're going to sing Look and Live 354. Please stand if you can. 354 are gone. They're going to come. <laughs> 